So good morning and welcome to today's cover talk. I'm Kelly Barnett, a principal associate in our insurance disputes team here at Mills and Reeve. And a key part of my practice is defending claims made against solicitors and also considering policy coverage points in this area. I'm very pleased today to be speaking with Andrew Spence, a trainee solicitor in our team. And first up, I just want to take you through a few housekeeping points. If you've got any questions during the session, we'd love to hear from you. Please do send these to us by typing in the box below. And we'll hopefully have time for my colleague, Harriet Strevens, our senior legal advisor, to pick these up for us at the end. Where we run out of time and don't get to all of your questions, we'll try and deal with those separately by email afterwards. So please do submit them. The session's being recorded. And while you can see us, unfortunately, we can't see you. So please do feel free to contact us and the recording and the slides will be circulated after the session. So you'll have those um, as well. Now, there's some key decisions making the headlines this year on the scope of cover in the solicitor's minimum terms. And RSA Tugans is one of them, which considers whether the minimum terms provide cover for civil liabilities that include a firm's own fees. Today, on the slide in front of you, we're going to focus on the key facts from the judgment, the key solicitors' policy points from the minimum terms, what this decision means for solicitors and their insurers, and potentially other professions that are subject to minimum terms, and there'll hopefully be time for a Q&A at the end. I'll now hand over to Andrew to take us through the facts of the case. Thank you, Kelly. So, what happened in the Tuggins case? Well, the Court of Appeal ruled that a solicitor's professional indemnity policy responded to a claim made against Tuggins, a firm in Northern Ireland, for damages which include a success fee paid to Tuggins by the claimant. Turning to the facts, as you can see from the slides, the events span a period of several years. Ian Coulter, the managing partner of Tuggins, and Brown Rudnick LLP worked together on a corporate transaction known as Project Eagle. Project Eagle involved the sale of a portfolio of property loans worth 1.6 billion euros from the National Asset Management Agency in Northern Ireland to a private equity company. The purchaser agreed to pay Brown Rudnick a success fee of 15 million pounds upon completion. Brown Rudnick then arranged to pay 50% of that success fee to Tuggins. The seller obtained confirmation from the purchaser that no part of the success fee would be paid to any current or former members of the Northern Ireland Advisory Committee. Mr Coulter at Tuggins and Brown Rudnick both gave various warranties to that effect. The transaction then completed in June 2014 and success fees were paid as contracted. Up until this point, the other partners at Tuggins were allegedly unaware of Mr Coulter's involvement on Project Eagle. He disclosed £1.5 million of fees to Tuggins and transferred the remainder of the success fee to an account in the name of one of his own companies registered in the Isle of Man. Mr Coulter came clean to his fellow partners at Tuggins about the transaction. He then transferred the success fee back to Tuggins and resigned. Tuggins reported Mr Coulter to the Law Society and notified their insurer of the circumstance. Now, the underlying issue here is that Mr Kushnahan, a former member of the Northern Ireland Advisory Committee, appears to have worked closely with Mr Coulter on Project Eagle and even had an office at Tuggins. This was an issue because Mr Coulter had expressly confirmed that there would be no payments made to government officials or any current or former members of the Northern Ireland Advisory Committee. Criminal investigations followed and charges were brought against Mr Coulter and Mr Kushnahan. Those have not yet concluded. Turning to the claim, Brown Rudnick brought proceedings against Tuggins, claiming that Mr Coulter had made false and fraudulent statements towards them, which includes not advising them of his intention to transfer part of the success fee to Mr Kushnahan. We should say at this point that whether the assurances given by Mr Coulter were a misrepresentation have not yet been determined, but the Court of Appeal gave their judgment on the basis that this had been found. Brown Rudnick's claim includes damages, which uh, include repayment of a sizable success fee that had been paid to Tuggins. Tuggins insurers RSA reserved their rights and then declined cover under the policy on the basis that, well, firstly, Tuggins' involvement in Project Eagle was not a civil liability incurred in connection with Tuggins' practice as a solicitor. 
And secondly, the policy was a contract of indemnity, which would only respond to a loss. And that any liability in respect of the Tuggan success fee was not a loss. Turning to the policy, the insuring clause on screen is from a solicitor's policy in Northern Ireland. It's substantively the same as the SRA minimum terms that we're all familiar with, albeit that it pulls together a few paragraphs from the minimum terms and conditions. So the policy provides insurance for any civil liability, whereas the minimum terms and conditions provides for any uh, for civil liabilities within private legal practice as a solicitor, which means that if the solicitor is acting outside the usual practices of a solicitor, the policy will not respond. And there is a question here as to who makes that decision. Is it the, the solicitors themselves or is it an objective test of the actions of the solicitors? Finally, the policy excludes fraud and dishonesty, which includes other partners condoning or having knowledge of another partner's fraud. We know that the minimum terms wording for solicitors is wide and provides significant cover with limited exceptions. Even if any individual is dishonest or fraudulent, the policy will protect the innocent partners if in the firm if they were unaware of it. And where it's a large or medium sized firm, it would be a high bar to suggest that all remaining partners condone the actions of an individual. You may be aware of Discovery Land Company and Axis, which is currently in the Court of Appeal. That case concerns what constitutes condoning and will be discussed in a future cover talk. But for the purposes of today, the first instance decision suggested that a fairly high level of knowledge was needed to establish condoning, more than just having a suspicion that something's not quite right. Following RSA's decision to decline cover, Tuggins initiated arbitration proceedings. In the final award delivered in 2021, the arbitrator made the following declarations. First, the claims against Tuggins arose in connection with its legal practice as a solicitor, as Mr. Coulter's actions to shape and structure the Project Eagle deal fell sufficiently within the scope of cover. And second, that there was no breach of the indemnity principle. The arbitrator considered that there was no reason to strip Tuggins of the success fee, as the fee was due and payable for work which was done on Project Eagle. RSA challenged the second declaration on a point of law, but the High Court also found in Tuggins' favour. RSA had leave to appeal on the indemnity principle, and there argued that Tuggins were never entitled to the success fee, as it was obtained by misrepresentation. My colleague Kelly will talk you through the Court of Appeals decision. Thank you, Andrew. Excellent. Now, the Court of Appeal rejected the appeal and found in favour of Tugans. The paid success fee was held to be covered by the policy, and the reasons for this are currently on screen. To take those in turn, we first come to the indemnity principle. And this had been RSA's core reason for the appeal. So insurers argued that Tugans was not entitled to retain a success fee where it had been obtained as a result of misrepresentation. The firm had not lost something to which it was entitled if it was required to return it to the claimant as part of any damages claim, and they could not obtain indemnity for more than they had actually lost. The court said in response to this, and the quote is on the slide, that Tugans had earned the contractually agreed fee by completing contractually agreed work and that they were entitled to it. So if they were then deprived of that fee due to the claim and had to return the fee or pay damages, they would have suffered an indemnifiable loss under the policy. They'd effectively have completed the work without pay. Also, the remedy for misrepresentation was to void the contract, but the retainer had not been voided here and Tugans had therefore provided services for the transaction and were entitled to be paid. The court said that the insuring clause is expressed widely as any civil liability, which did not draw any distinction between fees and other forms of liability, so fees fell within this cover. I think it is interesting here that the payment Tugans were entitled to is a large success fee and one obtained in circumstances where a file hadn't been opened and the firm wasn't fully aware of the transaction. And that's perhaps what makes this decision feel even more unusual or uncomfortable on its facts. Rather than a situation perhaps where services were being provided by a team of lawyers, including billable hours over a six month transaction in the usual way and had been paid accordingly. Secondly, public interest was highlighted by the court here. Had Tugans been left uninsured and had they been without the funds in the business to return the success fee, the court was concerned that this would leave the public vulnerable to claims and unprotected. 
A client should have full protection for its loss, including any wasted fees that have been paid to the solicitor. And this guards against firms going insolvent, for example. The next point the court was clear on was that the commercial and regulatory purpose of compulsory minimum terms insurance, as we have here, was to protect partners and employees from their own negligent mistakes, but also those of their colleagues. The court said that the actions of one partner, here Mr Coulter, could, should not impact the other 10 insured equity partners in Tugans, and in turn their clients, unless they were either parties to or condoned the misconduct. It's not usually how we see claims framed here, but there was also brief discussion in the judgment as to whether claims for solicitors' fees that are claimed as restitutionary damages may be covered, in particular where fees have not yet been earned as no work's been done. The court gave an example, which is on the slide at the moment, that where a solicitor's firm receives monies up front on account of fees, and that's before the work's carried out, and these may then be stolen by an employee or negligently transferred out of client account, you know, before any work's even been undertaken. And it was thought that this would be covered as a loss, and in particular, again, with that public protection in mind. So where does this leave solicitors and their insurers? Well, this case certainly reinforces a point that the insuring clause in the solicitor's minimum terms remains widely drafted, so as to continue to protect clients and innocent partners. And that's really important. It's also probably why solicitors' cover is often expensive, Although there have been signs of this market stabilising in the most recent October 2023 renewal after several years of increases in a hard market. On that note, um, I'll pass over to Harriet and ask if we've got any comments or questions from others to pass on to our audience. Thank you, Kelly. Yes, it's the short answer. Great. You know, this, this case <coughs> excuse me, throws up a number of anomalies which leave a feeling of unease. Ultimately, it concludes that paid fees are covered. We don't know if it's going to be appealed, but my first question is, do you, do you think we can assume that this case will be distinguished on its facts? Thanks, Harriet. So, Tugans concludes that paid fees are covered, but yes, the facts are unique. And, and famous last words, but I doubt they're going to come up too regularly. And it's easy to see why they were not palatable to insurers. The size of the success fee here also may have impacted on the outcome. And I'd say it's not a one size fits all approach as things aren't often in these area. And there may still be scope to investigate and decline covers for fees. I'd also say for those dealing with regularly, that it's not unusual to receive heads of loss in a claim that include an element of solicitor's fees. So we'll, we'll all be used to seeing that quite regularly. And a less controversial example that may be covered is where fees have been incurred taking additional steps, such as proceeding with litigation. So where litigation continued, but would not have continued had it not been for the solicitor's negligent advice, and we get these wasted fee type claims, it would be more um, common for us to see these covered. And it certainly remains the case that unpaid fees are not covered by the policy. And the judge commented on offsetting in particular. But one thing that sometimes is necessary for both solicitors and insurers to be pragmatic about in this area and address at settlement stage is whether, you know, these are going to be some kind of compromise can be reached in this area between insured solicitors and their insurers. And that includes in a situation where an insured solicitor is denied breach and made a counterclaim in their fees, for example. Those are the types of discussions that commonly see us having at that stage. Thank you, Kelly. What, what about the exclusion of trading debts? Does this remain untouched? Question. So okay. the, trading, the trading debt exclusion still applies and it's worth highlighting it here because it's dealt with expressly in the judgment. It's fair to say that a firm cannot simply high, you know, rely on their insurers to replenish unpaid fees, and that remains the case. Although, of course, sums taken from client account are a challenge for insurers because they do need to be immediately replenished under the minimum terms, and we all know that's dealt with expressly. The claims and underwriting teams may need to consider as a group how they're approaching claims for paid solicitors fees. And I think that includes in more straightforward cases where the fee element of claims may have been routinely confirmed as not covered in the past. So ombudsman decisions always come to mind for me um, because they're not making a legal decision as such and they're instead looking at what's just fair and reasonable. They often split fees and damages in their decisions, but that's actually done without more of a dive into why this distinction is being made. So it may just be that people need to pause and ask an additional set of questions here about the fee element of the claim or the decision that's in front of them. And I think it'll be really helpful for brokers and insurers to have this information to hand to be ready to provide it also. 
there's a lot to think about, isn't there? And, and somebody else asks whether it's correct to say that the Court of Appeal reached their decision on the basis that the assurances given by Mr. Coulter to third parties were misrepresentations. And of course, we don't know whether that was in fact the case. Um, equally, we don't know precisely what other partners in the practice knew about the matter or whether they did condone what was going on. And of course, one then asks the question, well, surely actual knowledge or suspicions about fellow partners should probably be considered. Do you have a view on that? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's very interesting, isn't it? Mm. Um, certainly something I thought about in reading this judgment. Of course, the provisions around the dishonesty exclusion and what other partners are aware of will remain important to be interrogated in these cases. And in each individual matter, the circumstances will be slightly different. The outcome of the Discovery Land and Access case that Andrew mentioned earlier in relation to condoning another partner's actions, that was heard last week um, on appeal. So the decision from that's eagerly awaited. And on that basis, I think it's fair to say, let's wait and see what that judgment says about condoning generally. Yes, and of course, as is also pointed out, we don't yet know whether the decision in Tugans will apply or affect the position of other professions, do we? No, and I, I knew this would come up. Um, thank you. The uh, the decision itself doesn't actually address whether or not these principles only apply to solicitors, or if they also apply to other professions that have their own minimum terms, such as accountants. Mm. So where policies are not bound by compulsory minimum terms, including excess layers, I can see that insurers have a bit more flexibility, and that they may be revisiting their scope of cover here to deal with these points. But I know you and I have discussed previously, Harry, that solicitors are in quite a you know, unique position here as trustees. And that's yeah. possibly why things are dealt with differently and why public policy comes through so strongly in this judgment. Yeah. Um, I know we've discussed that accountants, perhaps another profession where some take on these trustee type roles. So there's possibly something to think about there. So, so what would be your parting message for insurers today, such that one is able to give any parting comment? <laughs> Well, I think, what, I think what is clear is that this is now a proceed with caution area for insurers and solicitors, and we're keen to see how this involves and whether if great uncertainty is required, there may even need to be a revision to the minimum terms wording in due course. So that's a case of watch this space and um, please all keep us posted on what you're seeing in this area. I'd be, I'd be really interested to hear from you so that we can all stay part of the discussion. Well, I think the discussion's already started on a number of questions we've <laughs> yes. yet to actually address, but unfortunately our time doesn't allow and we need to keep ourselves confined to our 15 minutes if we can. But as you previously said, you can deal with those by email if necessary. So I'll pass the baton back to you if I may to close up. Thank you. Thank you, Harriet and Andrew, and thank you all for joining us.